few of you saw the tides up in minor space in yesterday, and in today's talk, I'd like to say a little bit about why the tides this year are especially high. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, they were a bit higher than average, but uh, later this year, they're going to be quite a bit higher. First, a basic introduction. The moon is the prime cause of the tides on our planet. The sun also contributes, but here is a picture showing the reason how the moon uh, creates two tidal bulges. The black arrows in the diagram represent the force of the moon on Earth. And as you'll notice, the arrows get bigger toward the bottom. The closer to the moon, the greater the gravitational attraction. So the, the light blue uh, crescents on Earth there represent the oceans. And you can see that the, the large arrow at the bottom pulls extra hard on the close part of the ocean, pulls it toward the moon more so than it does, more so than it pull, the moon pulls on the Earth. I just went, am I still here? Yes, good. And so the, the lower bulge there gets ahead of the Earth, makes a high tide at that point. And in the same way that th that water gets ahead of the Earth, Earth in turn, because the force on the Earth is bigger than the force on the far part, Earth gets ahead of the water on the backside. So it leaves it partially behind, making the second bulge. So you get the two tidal bulges, and that will give you, as Earth rotates once per day, will give you the so-called uh, semi-diurnal tide, the two t high tides a day. Oops, wrong button this way. And of course, because the sun also contributes in the same fashion, depending upon the phase of the moon, you'll get an increased tide or a somewhat decreased tide. At new moon, the top part there, shows the moon and the sun aligned so that they both contribute to the tides, and the same thing happens at full moon. That may seem a little strange, but it's a case of free fall, and both the moon and the sun create the double bulge. So in any case, in the top part and the middle part, uh, the moon and the sun are both acting in the same direction. At the quarter moon, at the bottom, the moon has the bigger effect, so the lunar tide is the dominant one, however the solar tide tends to subtract from it. And that gives you the uh, terms uh, neap tide for when it subtracts and spring tide when they add together. Two photos of the full moon. I took the one on the right when the moon was at perigee, 357,000 kilometers out and the one on the left when it was at apogee, at about 406,000. Same length, same focal length, and uh, you can see the, the difference. You can't tell that just looking at the moon in the sky on any one night, but it's a, quite a dramatic difference. And that, of course, affects the moon's gravitational effect on the tides. And as the moon goes around its somewhat elliptical orbit, the, its effect on the tides varies depending upon how close it is to perigee or apogee. I'll just read the text there because it's perhaps not that legible from the back of the room. The tidal effect increases rapidly as the Earth-Moon separation decreases, making the lunar tides about 30 to 50 percent greater at perigee than at apogee. Those are so-called perigean tides when the moon is here at perigee. <clears throat> when the major axis of the moon's orbit aligns with the sun, the sun's tidal effect decreases the moon's perigee distance, resulting in the largest perigean tides. And that's why the range here, 30 to 50 percent, when the things line up, the perigee distance gets even less and the tidal effect is bigger. And that gives what are called perigean spring tides. If the major axis were fixed, the major axis, by the way, is through here. 
perigee to apogee, if the major axis were fixed in direction, it would align with the sun every six months, if you think of Earth going around. However, the sun causes the major axis to rotate slowly prograde, eastward, with a period of 8.85 years, making the alignment occur every seven months. So there's a, a drift in the direction of the major axis. <clears throat> There's another variable besides the elliptical nature of the lunar orbit. The orbit is tilted. <clears throat> the sun exerts a tidal torque on the orbiting moon tending to align the plane of the lunar orbit with the plane of the ecliptic. Here in this diagram the black line is the ecliptic or Earth's orbital plane and here the green line is Earth's equatorial plane or what we call the celestial equator. Of course, the one is tilted about 23 degrees to the other. The lunar orbit is tilted to the ecliptic. It can be uh, as much as five degrees either way relative to the ecliptic. The moon responds to that torque from the sun with a wobbling orbital plane, the nodes of the orbit precessing retrograde or westward along the ecliptic with a sidereal period of 18.60 years or 18.61 years relative to the precessing vernal equinox. On October the 9th this year, the ascending node of the lunar orbit arrives at ecliptic longitude 180 degrees, which is the autumnal equinox. And the diagram shows the corresponding situation at the vernal equinox with the uh, descending node of the lunar orbit at ecliptic longitude zero. And look at this yellow line here for the, this year, 2015. The, uh, where was I? Yeah, and it also show, shows the geometry half a nodal period from now. If you add half of the 18.61 year period, half of it, to 2015, you come to 2025, and in that year, the lunar orbit will be five degrees the other way to the ecliptic, and you can see what that does to the lunar orbit relative to the celestial equator. This year, 2015, it's only 18, degree, 18 degrees off, whereas half of that nodal period later, it's up to 28. So during 2015, the moon stays as close as it can to Earth's equatorial plane. The deck range is plus or minus 18 degrees, and that augments the semi-diurnal ocean tides. Now, why should that make the tides bigger? In this diagram, I, I'll show why that's so. Of course, that's Earth. It shows the tidal bulge in the dark blue, and there's another light blue tidal bulge that hardly shows up on the screen, but it's there. The dark one is for the moon at declination zero, right above the equator. The other one, and here's the axis of the other one, is for the moon at declination 28. Compared to the moon at deck 28, at deck zero, the semi-diurnal lunar tide at le the latitude shown, I picked this latitude line here, gains a depth A and loses a depth B if you compare the two tidal bulges. It's that much deeper for the dark blue one than the light blue, and over here, it's in the reverse order, but it's a smaller amount. And in most parts of the oceans, A is greater than B, Thus, a low deck moon is favorable for large, larger semi-diurnal tides. In every year, this is true for spring tides, namely a new or a full moon, near the time of an equinox. Because at an equinox, both the moon and the sun have a low declination, producing what are called equinoctial tides. A long-term similar tide enhancement occurs with the 18.61 year nodal period when the moon's deck range is near its 18 degree minimum as it is this year. So that, that's why, you can see from the diagram, why the tides tend to be, or they are bigger when the moon 
is closer to the equator. I'm going to follow with a few pretty pictures, so be patient. <laughs> If the axis of the moon's orbit did not precess, and here I've shown uh, our orbit around the sun, sun at the center, and here's the moon with its elliptical orbit, and if that major axis of that orbit did not precess, every six months you would get the alignment with the sun. And if that were so, uh, perigee and spring equinoctial tides would occur at half the period of the precession of the equinoxes. In other words, you'd have to wait 13,000 years to have such tides. But because the axis of the orbit precesses, the moon's orbit precesses prograde with a period of 8.5 years, the perigee and spring equinoctial tides occur at half that period namely every 4.425 years. For example, in 2011, this year, again in 2020. So uh, the tides this year being extra strong, it's because of that precession of the major axis of the lunar orbit. I should comment that uh, the first person to figure all this out quantitatively was Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton once said that Trying to understand the moon made his head hurt. <laughs> so if you're feeling that way at the moment, you're in good company. <laughs> so, why is there an extreme tide this September, namely September the 29th? Three things. This is sort of a summary of what I've been explaining. The 206-day perigee and spring tide cycle peaks in September this year, providing an unusually small time window, barely one hour between syzygy, including a total lunar eclipse, and an unusually close perigee on September the 28th. The 4.43-year perigee and spring equinoctial tide cycle peaks this year, in particular, the above-mentioned perigee and spring geometry occurs less than five days after the 2015 optumal equinox, providing nearly uh, ideal conditions for a perigee and spring tide with equinoctial enhancement. And thirdly, the moon's ascending node arrives at the autumnal equinox on October the 9th, which I mentioned a few slides back, and that's only 11 days after the eclipse. Thus, the 18.61 year nodal cycle minimizes the moon's declination range this year, thereby providing maximum nodal enhancement of the semi-diurnal tide. Again, it's a lot to take in in a few moments, but uh, that's why we are due for a big tide in late September. Here's a graph. Uh, my friend Sherman Williams put this together using tide prediction data. And it shows the tide range in uh, minus basin at Burnt Coat Head in particular. And he took the largest tide ranges uh, over various months. And the horizontal scale runs from 2013 through to 2018. And you can see that the range uh, over 15 and a half meters here, it goes up and up and then curves over and starts dropping again. What you're looking at there in that blue graph is the peak of the 18.61 year cycle this year. And you can see it's a bit ragged because there are a lot of variables in the moon's motion. But right here in, on February the 1st last year, it came pretty high. The September 29 this year point is there, and there's one same height here, which is next April, April next year on April the 9th, and then it falls away again. My next uh, picture is of a photo taken on this particular day, and that's a 16.5 range of the tide, and I'll show you the photo. 
This is at the East Dyke at Grand Pre, and here's the dyke wall, and of course you can see the tide, and here's the level of the fields behind the dyke. The tide is quite a bit higher, and it's getting pretty close to the top of the dyke. So that was a really quite exceptional tide, but it's predicted to go higher than that this September and again next April. A friend of mine took this picture. I didn't take that. Um, I've gone too far. Back one. It, there's another variable that nobody can predict, and that's the weather. The barometric pressure and the wind affects the tide level too. It can raise it or depress it. Um, those dikes will be inundated if there's a storm surge on September the 29th this year. The chance of that is small, but it does happen occasionally. The last time was in 1869. Um, anyway, forging ahead here, this plot is Burnt Coat Head again. That's uh, one of the sites in Minas Basin. Horizontally, it's a bit more than a century, from 1995 through to the year 2100. Vertically, it's the Julian day of any particular year, starting at January the 1st and running through the months to the end of December. And what has been plotted here, it looks like a chickenpox epidemic, uh, there's a color code here which gives the range of the tide at Burnt Coat Head. And the peak here is 16.5, it starts in the white down around 13 or so. So the more intense the color, especially tending from it to red into black, means a higher tide. And these are predictions. And for any one year, you would run vertically up a line and uh, pick off the peak tides during that year. Um, there are some things that are really neat here. You can see there's a line of color here. There's another one here another one here, and so on. Those intervals are the 18.61 year intervals. Shows up in the predictions. Another thing you can see, and it's a bit more subtle, but if you look horizontally through here, there tends to be a bit more concentration of color. And again up here. Through here, that's the spring equinox. That's the equinox, that's the equinox effect on the tides. And up here, of course, you're into September, September, October. That's, again, the equinox effect on the tides. So that shows up. If you take any one line and go up, you can pick off, um, you can sort of see it, but I don't want to spend too much time on the details here. But there's a red dot there, red dot there, red dot there, and then they start fading off. The separation of the red dots is the perigee cycle of the moon, roughly one month. But it fades off because perigee doesn't say coincident with the new or full moon. It, it drifts through the moon phases. So the tide drops off when it, they don't coincide. Anyway, it's a really neat plot, although you have to sit down and think about it to really appreciate what you're seeing. The other thing that's uh, a bit scary says this is adjusted for sea level change due to crustal subsidence, which is happening here in Nova Scotia, and the impacts of climate change. And look at the colors, they're getting more intense. That means a higher tide. The uh, provincial government is worried about the dikes. They're working on them at the moment to raise them. Uh, higher tides are coming. One reason besides climate change and crustal subsidence is that the deeper the oceans get because of the rising sea level, the closer to resonance becomes the Bay of Fundy, and that makes the Bay of Fundy tides higher. So there's at least three effects going on there. Um, same chart, and I just uh, put arrows on. That dot right there is the picture I showed a year ago, February the 1st, the, uh, the dike picture with the tide near the top. There is the one for this September, and there's the one for next April. They show up very nicely. And this is my last messy diagram. Uh, 
the heavy circled items around the side, and there are five of them are listed here. That's Earth's rotational period, not 24 hours, it's the true sidereal period. That's the draconic month, the time for the moon to reach the ascending node, the period. That's the sidereal month, the time for the moon to make precisely one orbit relative to the stars. That's the anomalistic month. These are all in your handbook, by the way. Uh, <laughs> the anomalistic month, which is the moon at perigee, so that's the moon's perigee period. And finally, that's Earth's orbital period, or the sidereal year. But what, what you can do here, using those five, you can pair them up. Um, there are beat frequencies here, and whenever two oscillations uh, are merged, the frequencies, you take the difference to get the frequency of the beat. Now, the numbers there are periods, and that's equivalent to taking the product of two periods and dividing by the difference. So it's the same physical thing, but you're dealing with periods. But just to take an example, and the pink arrows are relevant here, if you take the Earth's spin and the moon's orbit, the sidereal month, and take the product, divide by the difference, what you get is the time for the moon on the meridian, 24 hours and 50 minutes. And because there are two tidal bulges, you divide by two, and that gives you the M2 tide, so-called, the uh, semi-diurnal lunar component of the tide, 12 hours, 25 minutes. That's the interval between two high tides. Uh, if you take the year here, the uh, orbital year, and the moon's uh, orbit time, product over the difference, that generates the lunar phase period of 29.53 days. And if you pair that up with the anomalistic month, that gives you the period between perigee and spring tides, 205.9 days. I'd like to go through all these things and talk about them, but uh, I won't. But it, it's a neat diagram because it summarizes all these interacting frequencies. And some of the notation here, like M2, N2, M sub F, S, S sub S A, S2, that notation appeared in the late 19th century. Um, George Darwin and uh, William Thompson, or Lord Kelvin, were the first to tackle the problem of the uh, various frequencies in the tides, and they did a frequency analysis, and these uh, uppercase letters, that's their notation, for the various components from analyzing the tides. So those pop out too, and uh, it's really neat to go through this with a calculator and convince yourself what's going on, but th they're all generated by these five basic things. So, enough for that. Pictures. There's a fairly high tide on Minas Basin, and I show this particular shot of the bales of old cardboard there aren't very attractive, but the gentleman standing on the corner of the wharf is John Wheeler. Uh, John Wheeler He's deceased now, but he was one of the pioneers in reinvigorating general relativity theory back in the 1960s. And uh, he is known as Mr. Black Hole, I guess, although he, he didn't coin the term, but he certainly promoted it. Anyway, there he is standing on the corner of the Hansfort Wharf at high tide. Yesterday, somebody asked me after they saw the tide, what was the range of the tide yesterday? Was it a meter? And I couldn't really tell because we were at Evangeline Beach where the sea coast is very gradual. The tide goes out a long way. And uh, if it was extremely flat, you might say, well, a meter could come in that far, a meter of tide, and flood it. But it wasn't, it was a 13.7 meter tide. Now the tide in this picture, the next picture will show you what uh, Dr. Wheeler was impressed by. I was scared to death he was going to trip and fall, <laughs> but he didn't. Uh, but uh, that's the uh, sort of tides we get up there. That was not as high as the tide will be this September. 
but it, it uh, does point out the range of the tide in Minas Basin. I haven't heard the bell yet, but I'm done. <laughs> I, I, I would like to thank Dave Chapman. Dave, are you here? Yes. I'd like to thank you for promoting an interest in the moon. The, the moon and its motions and its effect on Earth are, I think, interesting, especially when you are standing by the, <coughs> excuse me, standing by the tides. And I sort of like thinking about the moon rather than dark matter, dark energy, which might not be there at all, because I can see it and it's creating real effects and with some effort I can understand what's going on. So thank you, Dave. <laughs> one question. Okay. okay. Oh, no, there's one or two here. Testing, testing. Is this working? Okay, okay. Um, when Roy said that uh, Isaac Newton said that this stuff made his head hurt, my, it's not a question, it's a comment. Every few years I'm foolish enough to ask Roy something about the tides. <laughs> and when I think I've got it figured out, I ask him a question and then I discover I don't have it figured out. And he told me, Isaac Newton said this makes his head hurt and it was such a huge comfort because I felt so stupid. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. Okay, thank you. Okay.